Hello everyone, I am very pleased to be here with David Boss. David Boss is an American evolutionary psychologist at the University of Texas at Austin. He researches human sex differences in mate selection, and he's considered one of the founders of evolutionary psychology. Boss earned his PhD in psychology at the University of California, Berkeley in 1981, and he is the author of this amazing book, Why Men Behave Badly. I have it in Kindle, Professor Boss. And he also is the author of Desire. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. I look forward to chatting with you. Yes, and as, as I was mentioning just before begin recording, your book, Why Be Men Behave Badly, was an eye-opener. And for all of us, at least at my own age, can really benefit in terms of getting to know ourselves, our mechanisms, instinctual mechanisms, our drives, just to understand who we are. And I remember Carl Jung's quote, if you understand your shower, shadow, so to say, you can, you can enhance your life here on earth so it doesn't come and, and bite you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Professor, tell me, how, how has your career unfolded until today? Okay, uh, well, that's a big question. So I'll give you a short, uh, shortish answer. So I was trained as a uh, personality psychologist. So um, that my there was no evolutionary psychology when I was getting my PhD at uh, UC Berkeley. And what I was interested in was um, human nature, you know, what motivates people, what makes people get out of bed in the morning, what makes people tick, what are the goals toward which people strive? And what are the fundamental uh, psychological mechanisms of mind that define who we are as a species, human nature? And what I found is that the then existing field of personality psychology had a bunch of theories of human nature, like you mentioned, Carl Jung uh, and Freud, and that um, all these different theories of personality that purported to explain human nature uh, some of them had some, some elements had intuitive appeal, uh, but they lack a solid scientific foundation, you know, that is, and I wanted to build a theory of human nature on a solid scientific foundation that was not arbitrary, that was not just one theorist's opinions about what human nature was all about. And so what that drove me toward is, well, what are the causal processes that created whatever nature it is that we have, and that drove me to evolutionary theory because evolutionary theory, and specifically evolution by natural and sexual selection, is the causal process that creates complex adaptations uh, of the body and of the brain and of the mind. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so that's what kind of led me to that. And then I was also so I started doing a lot of reading. One of the astonishing things is you can get a PhD in psychology without ever having taken a single course in evolutionary biology or evolutionary theory, which is astounding because it is, it, 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 you couldn't study any other species and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to understand the causal processes by which um, rat nature or gerbil nature or porcupine nature comes into existence. So, uh, so I had to basically self-educate. Uh, on that. And I was very fortunate to get my first job post PhD at Harvard, uh, which allowed me a lot of freedom to uh, educate myself and to start conducting studies that I really wanted to, um, to conduct having to do with mating. Because I mean, one of the things that I, I feel very fortunate in that I uh, picked on mating. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, mating is a natural because in sexually reproducing species, everything has to go through the mating process. You know, you have to, each one of us, one, one way to say this is each one of us is, a, is an evolutionary success story. That is, we have descended from a long and unbroken chain of ancestors, each of whom succeeded in selecting a fertile mate, attracting the mate, be reciprocally chosen, chosen by that mate, holding on to that mate, having sex with that mate, and reproducing and having children and raising them to reproductive age. And so we are all evolutionary success stories. And so, um, and so mating isn't just some random topic, but the topic of mating was virtually unknown in the field of psychology. I mean, there were 
psychologists had largely ceded it to sociologists who didn't, who were very apsychological, and there were no good theories of human mating when I got into it. And so, um, so I got into it when I was at Harvard, and then I continued when I moved to the University of Michigan, and um, and just uh, you know my research ex uh, program exploded in looking at all these different facets of human mating. What do we look for in a long-term mate? What do we look for in a short-term mate? What about an affair partner? Um, what about conflict between the sexes, which is, the, as you mentioned, the focus of my new book? Uh, what about mate poaching? What about infidelity? What causes infidelity? Uh, what about mate switching? Why do people break up and seek alternative partners? And so, um, so I was very fortunate in that this, you know, it was very virgin territory. And so, uh, so I started publishing on it, started writing books about it, and uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. And I, every time I think, uh, well, I'm going to do things, I'm going to start studying things other than mating. So I had a brief foray into studying murder, homicide, um, and it, it turns out that even murder, most of the motives for murder are related to mating, either directly or indirectly. And so, one of the things I say is, you could you can run, but you can't hide from mating, it, it permeates everything wow. or virtually everything that humans do. No, that's amazing. And thank you for continuing to share with all of us your work for me has been very influential as one of the ideas that really ignites my heart is our evolutionary history or the or why are we the way we are who we are that's yeah. understanding our foundations is really one of my my hobbies, so to say. You mentioned so many ideas right now, David, so many that I want to choose the right one to begin our conversation around your newest book, Why Men Behave Badly. And I would like to get into the foundation of our ideas on mating. So what are the foundations like the theory or the building blocks of our understanding of mate choice? How did we get here? Well, um... <clears throat> Okay, that's a very big question. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll see if I can be brief. Um, uh, well, first of all, you know, this boils, this gets down to Darwin's theory of sexual selection. And Darwin, most people, when they think about evolution, they think about survival selection, you know, avoiding lions, tigers, and bears, and dangerous snakes, and preventing falling from cliffs, and getting... Uh, eaten or, or uh, infected with parasites. But uh, what Darwin noticed is that there were many things that could not be explained by this so-called survival selection or natural selection, that the brilliant plum plumage of peacocks, the large antlers of some you know, elk species, for example, uh, these couldn't be explained by survival selection because, uh, and, and so there are sex differences uh, and since both sexes face largely the same adaptive problems, why would they differ? That is, both sexes have to eat, both sexes have to avoid predators. Why would the sexes differ at all? And also, what, what would explain why different species differed in the magnitude of sexual dimorphism, the sexual dimorphism differences in the size, shape, morphology of males and females of the same species? Uh, and so Darwin came up with the theory, and this was in 1871, theory of sexual selection. The theory of sexual selection deals with the evolution of characteristics by virtue of the mating advantage, not survival advantage. So what leads to successful mating? Mm. What leads to failure in mating? And he identified two causal processes there. One is preferential mate choice, uh, and the other is same-sex competition. So with same-sex competition, the stereotype is two stags locking horns in combat. Victor gains sexual access to the female. Loser ambles off with a broken antler, dejected with low self-esteem. And the victor gains sexual access. And so whatever qualities lead to becoming a winner in these same-sex battles, those qualities get passed on in greater numbers and hence evolve, that is increase in frequency over time. Wow. And then with preferential mate choice, it requires there to be some consensus or agreement about what qualities are desired. And then uh, those who possess the desired qualities, get they get preferentially chosen. Those who lack the desired qualities get excluded, shunned, banished, or in the modern 
uh, parlance that become incels or involuntarily celibate. Um, so, and again, the logic is very simple, but very powerful. And that is that there will be evolution that has changed over time due to the uh, mating advantage of those who possess qualities that are desired by the opposite sex. And so the theory, theory of sexual selection basically lays the foundation for understanding all sexually reproducing species, including our own. Yeah. Now, uh, so, so the questions, the key questions that my early work uh, addressed, so like the, my book, you mentioned the evolution of desire strategies of human mating dealt with these fundamental questions of sexual selection in humans. That is, what are the qualities that men and women desire in long-term mates and short-term mates, et cetera? And also what are the tactics that men and women use to compete with each other to succeed in the mating game? Um, and so that's what the, uh, the evolution of desire is all about. And we know a great deal about what those, uh, what those strategies are and what the mate preferences um, uh, are. Now, one of the, uh, I should say on that, and then maybe we should segue into the conflict between the sexes, the topic of the new book. But one thing I should say is that our species is um, at least somewhat unique in several respects. Uh, we are very much unlike chimpanzees who are our closest primate relative, we're very much unlike them in our mating system. That is, we have long-term committed pair bonded mating as one of our mating strategies. Uh, uh, chimps don't. They basically, female comes into estrus or heat, males mate with the female when she's in estrus and they go their own separate ways. Yeah. So we have, uh, uh, so, that's, so that's one, we have long-term committed pair bonding Two, we have mutual bait choice. That is, it's not just females doing the selecting, males also do the selecting. So we have mutual mate choice. You have to be reciproc, you have to choose and be reciprocally chosen by the person that you are attracted to. And then we have other features like heavy male parental investment in offspring, relatively concealed ovulation and so forth. So, so you, you, you can't do what I call the pick a primate game and say, oh, humans are just like, bonobos or humans are just like chimps. No, we're not. We are unlike uh, all these other species in the, in the unique elements of our mating strategies. Wow. But nonetheless, the theory of sexual selection provides the overarching framework for understanding the mating strategies of humans. Wow. No, that's amazing. And it's, it's impressive <sighs> to think that even though we're so close to, our, to monkeys, to primates, we are such an underlier in outlier rather on on, yeah. on our own you know mating strategies and that's my biggest question that i have for you and we can say wait for uh, to your book why men behave badly is that you know do you think that choosing a long-term mate versus uh, or rather m moving from money monogamy to polygamy do you think monogamy arises from our rational mind and polygamy arises from our animal mind, quote unquote. What's the difference between these two choices of mate selection? Yeah, uh, well, I, I would reframe the question a little bit because I think that the way that I think about it is that um, it's, it doesn't do much, it, it's not accurate to characterize a species as monogamous or polygamous or anything like that because Uh, first of all, there are large individual differences and cultural differences. But the way that I think about it, and I think a more um, a sensible way to think about it, is that humans have evolved a menu of mating strategies. And this menu includes long-term committed mating, uh, uh, pair bonded mating, but it also includes short-term mating and also includes uh, polygyny, one man, multiple women, sometimes includes a polyandry, one woman, multiple men, uh, and then infidelity, you know, is, is a key part. And then even serial mating, that is mating with one person, pair bonding with them for a while, breaking up, mating with another person for a while, breaking up. So, so the question then, if we have this menu of mating strategies, the key question becomes how do the, what determines which mating strategy each individual adopts? And that depends on a variety of factors, um, such as your own mate value, how desirable are you in the mating market compared to other people? 
It depends even on things like um, cultural norms and laws, you know, is uh, polygyny, for example, uh, you know, legally permitted? Well, some cultures legally permit polygyny, other cultures forbid it. Now, we have to look at the, you know, what is uh, legally permitted and prohibited versus what people actually do. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, so even in, here's an example like the Aceh of Paraguay, a, a, a group of hunter-gatherers studied by the great uh, evolutionary anthropologist, Kim Hill, um, it, they, they legally permit multiple, uh, multiple marriages. Okay, however, something like 25% of the Aceh prefer monogamy. You know, and they just have one partner and prefer that. Other people do a lot of mate switching or marry multiple uh, partners. Uh, so we have to distinguish between what people actually do versus what the uh, legal system, you know, says we are permitted to do. And so even, even in Western cultures, um, United States, uh, Mexico, Western Europe, uh, much of Latin America, uh, we have presumptive monogamy. So, you know, we're supposed to just marry one person, but we have effective polygyny for some people. That is some people they have, a, let's say a man might have one wife, but a mistress on the side or one wife and some short-term sex when the opportunities present themselves or engage in serial mating you know, which is uh, break up, remate, break up, remate, which is a form of polygyny itself. Uh, so, uh, so that's the way, that's the way that I think about it, this menu of mating strategies. And then within those, we can ask the question, well, what, again, the Darwinian question, what qualities do people desire in each of these particular right. forms of mating? And then how do people compete for success in them? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to dive deep into what you just said the traits we all choose. So if we are thinking on a long term relationship, is there like a perfect recipe that you found in your research that people choose in terms of qualities and how are these qualities, you know, shaped by our own evolutionary code? Because we rationalize them. We say, hey, that she, she looks like a go getter. She's a long term thinker and everything. But are those ideas, those concepts built upon our evolutionary code? Uh, uh, the short answer, uh, my answer is yes. So um, one way of saying this, and, uh, and I owe this quote to Lita Cosmides, one of the founders of evolutionary psychology. And she says that there's no such thing as a non-evolutionary psychology. Mm. And, um, and I believe this to be true in that there's no other causal process other than evolutionary processes that are responsible for creating the mechanisms of mind, whatever they may be. And so all of it's evolutionary, the devil's in the details. So the issue is, well, what is the nature of our underlying psychology, the underlying psychological machinery that's driving these things? So, but you asked the question about, well, what makes for a successful long-term mate selection? Uh, there are a couple of things I'll mention, and these are not exclusive, but I'll mention a couple of highlights. One is, uh, in my study of 37 cultures, we found that people value things like intelligence, kindness, someone who's kind and understanding, someone who's dependable, uh, someone who's healthy, uh, someone who's attractive, um, and someone who's emotionally stable. So these are some things that people look for, and there are good reasons that they look for them. So no one wants a, a mean, stupid, ugly, disease-ridden mate. Uh, uh, but um, but that's a, an important thing. So you, you think, well, kind and understanding. Well, what does that mean? And why do people look for it? Well, it turns out that the opposite side of that being cruel and unkind is a leading cause of divorce worldwide. Uh, Laura Betzik documented this in her study of, I think, 89 different cultures. Uh, so um, uh, in long term mate selection, you want to also pick a mate who's going to be faithful. Uh, that is, is sexually and emotionally loyal to you. Yeah. Um, and importantly, you want to pick a mate who has a similar mate value to you. That is, if you're an eight, you want to pick another eight. If you're a six, you want to go for a six. Because um, if, there's, if there's too large of a mate value discrepancy, 
the higher mate value person, so let's say a guy is mated to a woman who's a, she's a six, she's an eight, she's going to be more likely to cheat on him and she's going to be more likely to dump him and trade up in the mating market to, yeah. to another eight. And this issue of mate value discrepancies and similarity in mate value is further complicated by the fact that they change over time. Uh, that is nothing in mate value remains static. So yeah. um, you could get sick, uh, you could get a promotion at work, you could become a social influencer, um, you could uh, win the lottery, you could lose, you get fired from your job. Nothing is static. Yeah. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's some, at least some uncertainty. And, but there are some elements of mate value that are predictable in terms of their trajectory. So you want to pick a mate, a mate who is similar to you in mate value trajectory over time. And so like, for example, one of the things that women prioritize is a guy who has resources, but more important, the qualities that lead to successful resource acquisition. And so does the guy have goals? Is he a hard worker? Is he ambitious? Does he have drive? Is, is he going places? And so, for example, like among undergraduate students, um, very few have any resources to speak of uh, uh, at all. But this guy might be a, um, you know, a future lawyer or a future doctor or a future entrepreneur. And you can and people can detect, you know, which guys are spending or, or women, which are who's, who's spending all their time eight hours a day watching, uh, playing video games. Uh, and smoking dope and drinking beer, as opposed to which um, males and females are, are actually putting work into their career and yeah. going places. So you have to look at not just mate value, but mate value trajectories over time. Yeah. But I would add that this emotional, uh, one other thing, and I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, but uh, I would say emotional instability is one of the biggest causes of conflict in relationships and breakups and divorce and so and it's a personality characteristic changes somewhat over time but um you know is this person moody are they emotionally volatile how do they handle stress mm -hmm. and it, it and someone who's emotionally unstable creates a lot of conflict in relationships and we know based on empirical studies they're more likely to break up over time so and, and in the meantime, uh, they'll torture you in your in your mateship. So, so uh, avoid emotionally unstable people in your mate selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for for all of those insightful ideas, David. Um, I want to. You're mentioning more and more like our shadow, the the parts that we don't really choose to in terms of having a long term relationship, such as emotional instability. And I want to get into the shadow aspect of why men behave badly, like the how all of the things we can get better at, so to say. But I before that, there was an essential piece that you mentioned in terms of the mate values. And I'm very curious because I don't think that our current social context, you know, we have a technological world, uh, intellectual, uh, talent is really valued as of now, but let's go back 2000 years, let's go about 100 years, maybe the the things that we ch choose as a priority as one of uh, aspects having uh, value in the mating market, were being a hunter or killing being able to kill mammoths, being able to bring to the table food. So do you think that our preferences, our mate preferences vary under the environment that we are so like right now let's say the upper hand goes to white collar uh workers quote unquote right so that's a great question uh and a very insightful question and i think that there are kind of a couple different uh approaches to answering your question um one is that uh, has to do with uh let's take the quality you mentioned resource acquisition so if you're in a hunter-gatherer society and you're a male Bring, being a good hunter is a key, is the key criterion. You know, Kim Hill, as I mentioned earlier in the Ache, and this is true of all hunter-gatherer societies, good hunting skills is what leads to high prestige and high mate value for males. Um, 
in the modern world, um, being a good hunter in most contexts is not. So if I, I'm an academic, I, if I go into my university and I walk into a faculty meeting and I, with a big moose that I've just killed, <laughs> slap it down the table, that will not increase my status, I can guarantee you. Uh, but there are other things that are uh, at a higher level of abstraction, resource acquisition. So, um, so in university context, for example, uh, do you have high, high status publications? Uh, are, do, you, do you bring in grant money that benefits the university? Uh, is your work viewed as important and hence raises the prestige of your department and university? Uh, and so, uh, and then of course, you know, as you mentioned in the business world, uh, are you the successful founder of a, uh, of a company that has become successful? Are you the, uh, these are extreme examples, but Elon Musk or, um, or Bill Gates or, or Steve Jobs or any of these people, but there are many such people who um, start their own companies and become independently uh, resource rich uh, as a result of that. So, so, so I, I guess what I would say is two things. So one is what, uh, at the heart, at a higher level of abstraction, resource acquisition and resource provisioning to the group is still, was true then and is still now, it comes in different forms. Yeah. Uh, meet in the past, uh, money and status and other things uh, in the current time. Uh, but the other part is that you're right that there's in some ways a mismatch between the environment in which we evolve and the modern environment. Uh, and so even things like, um, you know, physical prowess, and this kind of gets us into the conflict between the sexes issue, um, physical formidability yeah. uh, was very important in the past because there was more, there were higher levels of violence, higher levels of um, uh, group warfare, male and male coalitional warfare. And so being a physically formidable male was critical to, to your status uh, in the past, perhaps less so now, although I, st I still think there's still some carryover. So we still admire, even in the modern environment, the good athlete, mm -hmm. the, uh, the football player who's able to score the key goal. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, we still value these acts of physical prowess and then especially in team sports where you're benefiting your whole coalition by your acts of athletic prowess. So, um, so I think that while there are some mismatches between ancestral and modern environments, many of the same qualities at a deeper level of abstraction are still important. Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's really mind blowing. And I, I connected what you just mentioned with Nicholas Christakis's work. He also was a guest in the show and what you said on team sports, right? We, we see the football players really, really going after, you know, getting a lot of hits and everything. And it made me think while reading both of, of your books that maybe this kind of rituals, quote unquote, these our, our sports are like a compensation of our evolutionary past. You know, we used to, we used to be at war with nature and more than we are now in an, we're, we're in an, a more abstract level in war in nature. But mm -hmm. like football and soccer, all, all this tribalism going together and um, it's like an interesting compensation. That's the way I, I like to see it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I would say um, it's certainly interesting. I don't know about the word compensation. Um, what I would say is, I mean, even if you go to traditional cultures, they have things that are like our football and soccer. They have um, uh, matches and, and even within group, they'll have these you know, wrestling matches or chest pounding duels or, or running uh, contests where they evaluate the physical prowess and athletic prowess uh, of the members. And then of course, as you said, that we had small group warfare, um, much more prevalent in the past. And, um, and one of the interesting things about that is that it kind of, that psychology of my group versus the enemy group, my side versus the other side uh, is is getting played out in the modern times, even though we're technically not in war, right. in a, a physical combat, there's a kind of a ideological combat that's happening. Uh, and, and you see this 
I mean, you see it in every every walk of life and in, in politics and even in academia, you know, like in psychology, there are different schools of thought and they are competing with each other and derogating each other. And so there are, so we, which gets to the point is that all, all we have is our evolved psychology and it just gets, the, the underlying psychological machinery just gets played out in the modern context. Yeah, it's, it's impressive. And one of the conflicts that we've been throwing back and forth has been the battle of sexes, men versus yes. women. I'd love to get into that. You mentioned some of the overarching features of this conflict that, that we witness, such as, you know, incels for men and like this, some resentment that can happen between men and women and also the competition in the mating uh, arena, so to say. So my question would be for you, David, how are we failing to price in, quote unquote, our evolutionary past in order for our, quote unquote, ancient sexual psychology? How are we failing to price in our ancient sexual psychology in our current social landscape? And what can we do about it? Yeah, well, so um, that's a very big question. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, so well, let me take a stab at it at a couple, and then you can maybe direct me toward those elements that you want to explore the most. Yeah. Um, so in sexually reproducing species, sort of to start fundamentally, um, what's good for um, males, what's good, not in a moral sense, but in the sense of what leads to success, uh, the differs for males and females in some do domain. So for example, in the sexual domain, um, amount of investment prior to having sex, uh, how much time you want to elapse before having sex. Uh, and there's, there's a zone of conflict there where on average, and these are all on average sex differences, uh, women prefer a longer period of investment, longer time delay before having sex, men prefer a shorter one. And so that creates a zone of conflict where what you have is what in technical terms is called sexually antagonistic coevolution, which is analogous to predators and prey, where with predators and prey, you have these arms races where for each increment in speed and agility of a prey animal, like a, a gazelle, that creates selection for increments in speed and agility of the predators like cheetahs. And so you see these coevolutionary arms races where the slower, the weaker, the less fleet of foot get picked off or starved to death if they're predators. And the faster, the more nimble, the more psychologically vigilant, uh, they survive uh, and either get their dinner or, um, or survive to evade the predator. So the, by analogy, these co-evolutionary processes that are like co-evolutionary arms races occur within our species between the sexes. And so what you'll have is the evolution of adaptations in men to influence or manipulate women to be closer to their optimum and conversely adaptations in women to influence or manipulate men to be closer to their optimum. And so you have this battle of the sexes that gets played out. And this is just one example. Yeah. And there are many, many others that I talk about in, in my book. Uh, and so, uh, and so, and so, so that's sort of one. So there are many regions of conflict between the sexes. Okay, but in the modern environment, I think one of the key things is that males and females, and this is somewhat um, controversial in modern times, but the scientific evidence is overwhelming. Males and females have fundamentally different sexual psychologies. Okay, there's some overlap in the distributions, but these sex differences are large and profound. Uh, and in a way, we are stuck in the interiors of our own minds. That is, I don't really know what you're going, what's going on in your mind, or in the in the mind of a woman I'm interacting with. I have to make inferences about what's going on. Now, so we don't have direct access to um, to other minds, and so one of the things that people do is we use our own sexual psychology as a as a starting point or a default to infer the sexual psychology of the other sex. Now, this is highly problematic if the other sex is fundamentally different. So one example that this plays, I'll give this as a very vivid example, is um, uh, sending dick pics, you know, sending, uh, you know, sexting dick, dick pics, where studies show that, uh, you know, that men find 
uh, images of women's genitals and breasts and buttocks very attractive. And so men think, oh, well, then she's going to find images of my genitals very attractive. And women typically don't. So un especially unsolicited dick pics, women, most women say these are gross. Um, I, I, I don't want these. And whereas some men think, oh, this is going to, she's going to want to mate with me right away once she sees this, this image. And so, uh, so I think one of the keys to reducing conflict between the sexes requires education about what the sex differences are in our evolved sexual psychology uh, so that we can try to bridge that gap. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so, and so they occur, this is just one example, they occur in things like, um, uh, you know, uh, desire for sexual variety, you know, where there's a large sex difference, that is that men desire a much larger variety of sex partners than women. Uh, and even in the domain of uh, sexual harassment, you know, they, there are sex differences. So how harassing is this pattern of conduct? So say a man touches a woman uh, on her buttocks or leers at her or compliments on her, her on her breasts in the workplace. How harassing is this pattern of conduct? Well, women view that pattern as more harassing than men do. So men say, oh, well, it's no big deal. I mean, I'd like it if a woman complimented me on my buttocks, uh, you know, or my massive bulging biceps, you know? And so there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect uh, where men do not uh, fully appreciate how harassing and how upsetting this pattern of conduct is. And so I think the first step in reducing conflict between the sexes is one understanding what they are, what are the sex differences in our sexual psychology, and educating uh, men and women about each other's sexual psychology. Because men, men aren't the only ones who are off. Women uh, do not fully understand male sexual psychology. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so part of the book, uh, which I hope will be a um, positive impact of my book, uh, is that it will help to reduce conflict between the sexes by helping to understand each other's sexual psychology. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was one of my, my questions for you. Your hope after someone listens to our conversation or reads your book. And I think that the, the clear example of this is just opening the, the door for us to have a, a conversation on what we want and what are we looking for rather than always trying to make inferences, which almost always seem to backlash, at least for us in the modern world, we've seen how the Me Too movement emerged because people inferred, men inferred that women wanted something in the workplace or right. there wasn't this conversation. There wasn't this, this, you know, this, we, we would always just go ahead and do things that were inappropriate, but going into the future, David, what are your hopes in terms of this battle between the sexes? How can we overcome overcome our our blind spots? Yeah, well, I think, as I said, I think education about the evolved sex difference is, re is really the first step. Um, and, um, you know, and that's a large step. One, uh, there are a couple of ways in which we can do this. So one is there are some studies that have people imagine, let's say if you're a male, what if these things happen to your sister or to your mother or to your, your partner, your, your, your girlfriend or, or your wife or your close female friend? Like, so if, if the, in the workplace, your girlfriend or your sister, if a guy is touching her, unwanted sexual touching, uh, what would happen? And people, when, the, when it happens to someone they care about, all of a sudden they have a deeper empathy and understanding for this. And so I think, and I think we can leverage, and that's another feature of our evolved psychology, yeah. is that uh, you know we, we care deeply about all these um, alliances. And that's why, just to make a more meta point, it's not men as a group in opposition to women as a group. It's individual men who are in some instances in conflict with individual women, but also in alliance with and in cooperative alliance with some other women, like their sisters, mothers, girlfriends, and so forth. 
Um, and so, uh, so I think that we can kind of exploit or leverage our evolved sexual psychology around relationships mm -hmm. to make that transition to helping people understand better the underlying psychology of the other sex. Um, but another one here, here's another one that I talk about in the book. Um, it has to do with lo the laws and policies around things like sexual harassment. So I think that, um, and I'll make a kind of another meta comment here. Most sexual harassment is committed by a, a small subset of males. Yeah. So it's not all men who do it. And I think most men would find it morally uh, abhorrent to uh, commit acts of sexual harassment in the workplace, but a subset of men do. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I identify what that subset is. It's men who are high on narcissism, uh, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. They, they, lack, they lack empathy combined with a short-term mating strategy. And so what you have is a, uh, these are dark triad men who pursue a short-term mating strategy that commit the vast majority of acts of sexual harassment and sexual coercion as well, including rape. Uh, and so it's not all men. So we have to get away from thinking all men and all women. It's a subset of men and also a subset of women. Um, but um, in terms of policies and laws, say around sexual harassment, just to take that example, the laws and policies are written in gender neutral ways. Mm -hmm. they're, they're written in ways that the way that it's typically framed is, would a reasonable person view this pattern of conduct as sexually harassing? Now, the, the laudable uh, reason for why it's presented in a general neutral way is we, well, we want the laws to apply equally to everyone. Okay. However, we know empirically that most of the victims of sexual harassment are women and, and the overwhelming majority of perpetrators are men. Yeah. And we know that reasonable women differ from reasonable men in the ways that I just uh, mentioned a couple minutes ago. That is, a reasonable woman views that same pattern as harassing, whereas a reasonable man might not. So should the laws and policies be written according to a generic reasonable person standard, or should we uh, have a reasonable woman standard versus a reasonable man standard or split the difference or whatever, or even when it comes to who's the judge, what is the sex of the judge? What is the sex composition of the jury that's adjudicating these cases? Well, if it's majority of reasonable men, you're gonna come up with different verdicts than a majority of reasonable women would. And so I think that these um, scientifically established evolved sex differences in our sexual psychology have implications for how we design policies and laws around things like sexual harassment and also stalking and, <clears throat> and also a sexual coercion or, or rape. And so, but I think that it all boils down to a foundation of scientific understanding of what are these differences, sex differences in our sexual psychology, and then how do we deal with them? How do we educate people about them? And then how do we reflect them in, in our laws and policies? Wow, that's amazing. And it, it really made me think on everything that you said on our, the jury can make a, a huge influence in the, the sex of the jury can make a huge influence in a verdict. And those things we, at least I don't price in, in, in our current social landscape. And I hope in the future, after reading your work, really creates a more fruitful environment for both sexes so we can all enjoy our time here rather than be on the on a battle, so to say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it's the, the battle hurts both men and women. So like in the case of sexual harassment, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a subset, a small subset of men who commit or who are serial harassers in the yeah. workplace. And um, this harms the men who are not, you know, because you know, among other things, people say, well, oh, they, men get bl blank, blankly targeted. They say, oh, it's men who are sexual harassers. Well, that's true. Majority of sexual harassers are men, but most men are not, you know? And so, uh, and so that this causes conflict in the workplace where men become, well, given the current environment, 
uh, men, for example, have, have pulled back from mentoring junior women in the workplace for fear of being accused of being of sexual harassment. Wow. And then that harms women because that deprives women of the of access to mentors who can teach them about you know their profession and so forth. Yeah. And so these conflicts hurt both men and women uh, in the workplace. And so uh, again, understanding our deep evolved sexual psychology is critical yeah. to reducing these conflicts. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm becoming aware of, of our time. I just wanted to, to share with you that as a side of influencing the workplace, uh, in my former college, we were witnessing the Me Too movement emerge tremendously. Yeah. And I had a group of friends, a good group of friends that I, that I esteem and I see as people with integrity, being loyal, being good people yeah. uh, um, all around. And I wrote an article, I, I had never published it because of fears of getting canceled. You know, the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the, the times were very, very tumultuous in our college. But I would ask a lot of people in the, you know, in the parks over around the college, the public spaces, I would ask them, has this movement influenced the way you approach women, uh, mostly men, because as you say, uh, most sexual harassment cases happen from men to women. And a lot of people who never, never would, at least for me, in my perspective, I'm, of course, I have blind sides, I don't know the true intentions of, of people, but they would, they would say, I don't even want to approach people, women at my college because of fearing that something that I said would be misinterpreted. And yeah. there, there was this huge, it's, it's ongoing. There's a huge wall of shame for people who had, and also professors, like saying how they sexually assault someone. And some of the cases include just uh, the teacher only hires women. The, the teacher at home hires research assistants were women and that's sexist. So those kinds of things have been happening in, in college campuses as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, and these battles, the kind of um, political and ideological battles are getting played out, I would say, on college campuses and universities throughout the world, um, maybe even in ways more intensely than in other places. You know, perhaps because people are aware of these issues, they're on social media a lot, and um, and we are influenced by, you know, uh, I mean, this is another feature of our evolved psychology. We are we are a very social species, and so we're we're evolved to be very concerned about our reputation, our the esteem in which we are held by other people in the group, and so if the standards shift, you know, and these guys. Uh, don't want to damage their reputation um, uh, or their status in the eyes of their peer group by doing certain things. Uh, but but yeah, it's um, you know some have argued that um, you know that the Me Too movement has gone too far, you know, and had a chilling effect. Um, and you know, but but I think that it's also brought real problems to. Uh, real problems to people's attention. So um, what I think is, I think we, we need to have emotions calm down about these issues and look at the science. You know, the, the science has to guide it rather than our emotions around it. Absolutely. And, and this is also an aftermath of this. This is a new field, right? The workplace, men and women working together. It's just happening. It's new. For right. It's evolution. Exactly. Yeah. In terms of evolutionary psych, uh, our blueprint, we, we are induced uh -huh. to this. So hopefully this all this rocky uh, environment that we live in, and I, I believe it will, will just shape a much better and responsible and fruitful uh, social landscape for both men and women, you know? Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's my hope. And I, th and I think it will. Yeah. Um, it may take some time to work these things out because there's some resistance to even um, recognizing that men and women have a fundamentally different sexual psychology, for example, people don't like people don't like the idea of evolved sex differences. Um, in part, for some legitimate reason, people worry about uh, there will be discrimination against women if we somehow acknowledge that there are evolved sex differences. But here, we're not talking about sex differences in ability. We're talking about sex differences in our sexual psychology yeah. 
and our preferences. Um, and so it doesn't have any consequences for discrimination in the workplace, but you're absolutely right. So we, this is an example of a mismatch where ancestrally men tended to hunt and, and go to war in same sex groups. Women tended to gather, do child rearing in same sex groups. Uh, and so in the modern workplace, we have their sexually integrated. We have men and women interacting with each other and our mating mechanisms get activated and our sexual psychology gets activated in ways in which it is now inappropriate. And so, uh, but nonetheless, you know, we, we also can't forbid people from having relationships. People are, are attracted to people who have similar interests. And it's very common, like say in academia, uh, many people may get together uh, for people in their own department at their own university and so forth, because they share similar interests, similar values. So, uh, so uh, you know, how it will all shake out I'm optimistic that it will shake out well, but it's going to take some time, and also a uh, you know a, a, a trimming back of the emotions and hysteria around these issues to take a, a a recognition of the science of our sexual psychology and what those implications are for the workplace. Absolutely, and standing in the shoulder of giants like yours and you sharing your knowledge with. The, a lot of people and also my generation, uh, young people and college, uh, college students and, you know, all over the place, all over our society, we will, we're definitely in a good position to overcome these challenges, David. So I really appreciate you joining me, your, Thank you. your book, really, and all of your work, not only Why Men Behave Badly, truly sheds a light on our nature and it opens the door to having conversations on who we are and who we want to be so thank you so much for joining me this has been a, a tremendous pleasure thank you and thank you for um ha having such an intelligent conversation with me about these issues and you, you're you're going to have to take the lead in your generation and i wish you the best of success in doing so i appreciate you saying that david take care okay thank you <laughs>